Reaching for the Moon by Buzz Aldrin. The name my parents gave me was Edwin Eugene, but the name my sister gave me was the one that would stay with me all my life. Since I was the only son, everyone in my family called me brother, but my sister, Faye Ann, a year older than I was, could only manage to say buzzer. Later, it got shortened to buzz, and no one ever called me anything else. On summer nights, the moon hung low in the sky, so close to our house that I thought I could reach out and touch the soft white light. I never imagined that one day I would walk on its surface, but maybe it was meant to be. You see, before she was married, my mother's last name was Moon. My father's job with Standard Oil took him all over the country, and he flew his own plane from coast to coast. During World War II, he served in the Army Air Corps and came home for visits looking tall and important in his colonel's uniform. When I was two years old, my father took me flying for the first time in a small, shiny white plane painted to look like an eagle. I was a little frightened as the plane shuddered into flight, but mostly I was thrilled. I loved the speed, the sense of soaring high above the earth, supported only by the air passing around our metal wings. One day, I would fly in a different machine called the Eagle, but that would be many years in the future and a very different kind of machine. Usually, there was plenty to hold my attention right here on Earth. My family spent some many summers at Culver Lake in the Appalachian Mountains, and one summer, when I was about six or seven, I began collecting rocks. There was treasure everywhere I looked. Those rocks were precious. They were beautiful, and most importantly, they were mine. One morning, I gathered up the best of my rocks, put them in a bucket, and carried them down to the dock to show my friend. He wanted a rock. I didn't want to give one, give it to him. He pushed me, bucket and all, off the dock. I wouldn't let go of my rocks, even though the weight of them pulled me down. The light at the surface slowly drifted away. When my friend's father pulled me out, I still had my arms wrapped around the bucket. I knew that if something was important to you, you had to hold on. Determination, strength, independence. Those were qualities I worshipped in my favorite movie hero, The Lone Ranger. I went to the movies every Saturday, and sometimes I even snuck in through the fire escape when I didn't have the money to buy a ticket. I felt just like The Lone Ranger the day I set off to ride my bike across the George Washington Bridge to New York City. Ten years old, I pedaled 20 miles down unfamiliar roads and busy streets, past neighbors and strangers, out into the unknown. Just like The Lone Ranger... I didn't need help from anyone. It took me all day, but I found the way and did it myself. Almost every day I played some kind of sport, from swimming to high school track to pick up games of football in the park across the street. The older boys let me play because although I was small, I was tough. No matter what the sport, I played every game hard because I wanted to win. I loved being part of a team, working together to fight for victory, but it was even better to compete on my own like when I flew over the ball bar in pole vaulting. Then it was just me trying, with everything I had, to be the best. Whether I won or lost, it was up to me. When I finished high school, my father wanted me to go to the Naval Academy, but I chose West Point instead. I wasn't interested in the Navy. I wanted to be in the Air Force, and I thought West Point would help me get there. That first summer at West Point was the toughest challenge I had faced, we had to run everywhere, no walking allowed. We couldn't speak during meals. Every order from an upperclassman or teacher had to be obeyed at once. I followed every order. I studied every night. By the end of the year, I was first in my class. By the end of four years, I had the grades to do whatever I wanted, and what I wanted more than anything was to fly. After West Point, I joined the Air Force at last and learned to fly fight fighter jets, fast and quick in the sky. I loved the feeling of breaking free from gravity. I loved going as fast as a human being could go. When I finished my training, I flew 66 combat missions in the Korean War. After the war, I was stationed in Germany, learning to pilot planes that flew faster than the speed of sound. But there were men flying faster than that, America's first seven astronauts, the men in the Mercury program. Their goal was to be the first Americans to orbit the Earth. The astronauts seemed like supermen to me. I couldn't imagine myself exploring outer space, 
but that changed when my friend, Ed White, from West Point, told me his plan to apply to the space program. That was when I realized that the Mercury astronauts were pilots just like Ed and just like me. I already flew the fastest planes on Earth, but Mercury was a brand new adventure. It was America's first step into space, and I wanted to be part of it. I was already a good pilot, but the Air Force had many good pilots. I needed to find something I could do better than anyone else, something that would make me an astronaut. I went back to a university, to the same school my father had gone to, and studied aeronautics and astronautics. I specialized in something called rendezvous, learning how to bring two different objects together in space. Computers could do most of the work for rendezvous, but I believed that pilots needed to understand it themselves in case something went wrong. A computer can calculate numbers faster than the human brain, but people bring creativity and common sense to a problem, something a computer could not do. I dedicated my final paper to the American astronauts. Oh, that I were one of them. The first time I applied to the astronaut program, I wasn't accepted, but I didn't give up. When I applied a second time, I got in. I tried to appear as if I'd always known I'd make it, but inside I was bursting with excitement. I was already a pilot and a scientist. Now I was an astronaut as well. Along with the other men in the space program, I studied computers and instruments, that what went right and what went wrong on each previous space flight, and how to survive in the wilderness if my spacecraft crashed returning to Earth. We also had to learn to move in the weightlessness of space. The others trained with a system of ropes and pulleys, but I thought training underwater would work much better. I spent hours in the pool, tethered to an airline. The simplest movements, turning a handle, tightening a screw, had to be practiced over and over again. My first space flight was on board Gemini 12. My mission, along with my fellow astronaut Jim Lavelle, was to orbit the Earth and to practice rendezvous techniques with another vehicle in space. Once the spacecraft was in orbit, I put on my spacesuit, opened the hatch, and drifted out into space. Only a thin cord connected me to Gemini as we circled the Earth at 17,500 miles per hour, five miles every second. It took us less than two hours to go all the way around the world. But the speed didn't seem real to me. I felt as if I were gently floating while the Earth spun beneath me. I could see the great curve of my home planet, the brown mass of Africa, night falling over the Indian Ocean, a shower of green meteors tumbling into the Australian desert. After Gemini 12, there was a new mission, Apollo. The goal of Apollo was to put humans on the moon. Many people thought it couldn't be done. They thought that the powerful rockets needed to go that far could never be built. They thought that computers could never do all the calculations. They thought that even if we did reach the moon, we would never be able to take off again to come home. But, one by one, all of the challenges were met. Neil Armstrong, Mike Collins, and I were next in line for a space flight, so we were chosen as the team for Apollo 11, the flight that would land on the moon. Three years after my Gemini mission, I stood beside Apollo 11's Saturn V rocket. It was sunrise on July 16, 1969. Neil and Mike were already in their places on board. For a few moments, I was alone. All my life, I had struggled to learn, to compete, to succeed, so that I could be what I was in that one moment, an astronaut on a mission to the moon. I felt nothing but calm confidence. I was sure we would make it back, make it there and back. It was time for me to board. Neil, Mike, and I lay side by side on three couches, tightly strapped in. Beneath us, I heard a rumble like a faraway train, but as we lifted off, the movement felt so gentle that if I had not been looking at the instruments, I would never have known that we were on our way. Outside the window of the Apollo 11, the earth grew smaller and smaller. At last, we were so far away that I could hold up my thumb and block out the bright disk from my sight. After five hours, we could take off our spacesuits and helmets and move around the cabin. We ate chicken salad and applesauce for dinner with shrimp cocktail, my favorite of our freeze-dried choices. Then it was time to rest. rest. 
Wrapped up in sleeping bags, we floated above the couches, comfortably weightless. For the first time, for this time, Apollo 11 was our home, a tiny bubble of air and warmth speeding through the icy cold of space. Four days after launch, and after traveling 240,000 miles, we were in orbit around the moon. Apollo separated into two parts, Columbia, where Mike would wait in orbit, and the Eagle, the lander. The Eagle was powerful enough to take Neil and me down to the moon's surface and back up to the Columbia. But its walls were so thin, I could have punched a pencil through it them if I tried. The computer had chosen a spot for the Eagle to land, but through the window we could see that it was much too rocky. We couldn't rely on the computer to land the Eagle safely. We would have to do it ourselves. Neil took control. I called out him to let him know how far we were from the ground. 200 feet. 100 feet. 40. By the time the Eagle landed, we had used up almost all our fuel, with only 20 seconds left to spare. But we had made it. We were safely on the surface of the moon. I grinned at Neil. There was no need to say anything. We had work to do. Flight and space flight have always meant motion to me, but now the Eagle stood perfectly still. Neil and I put on our spacesuits, Neil climbed out first and descended Eagle's ladder to the moon's surface. Everyone listening on Earth heard Neil's first words. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I climbed down the ladder and joined Neil. There was no color on the moon. A flat landscape of rocks and craters stretched in all directions. Everything was gray or white. The shadows and the sky above were as black as the blackest velvet I had ever seen. I exclaimed, Magnificent desolation. I could see Earth, our home, in the sky overhead. Blue water, white clouds, and brown land. I could see the continents, and I knew that they were younger than the moon dust in which Neil and I were now leaving our footprints. I took out the American flag from the compartment where it was stored. Neil and I could force the pole only in a few inches into the moon's soil. I knew that more than half a billion people back on Earth were watching on television, and I worried that the flag would sag or tip. But when we took our hands away, it stood straight. I snapped off a crisp salute, just as I was taught at West Point. We moved quickly on to other tasks. I became a rock collector again, gathering samples for study back on Earth. Still, I remembered that brief moment perfectly so many years later. I remember the pride I felt and how I imagined the pride of every American on Earth. Neil and I set up a plaque that would remain on the surface of the moon with the simple words, Here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969 A.D. We came in peace for all mankind.